Well, what a joy it is for me to be here today in the first day of 2023 and, uh, and to have this marvelous uh, anthem and Bob Davies and Don, the brand, uh, what, a, what a beautiful thing to have uh, the principal organist and another principal piano player uh, from my era, too, to have the, you both t together. That was so, so wonderful. I have quite, you know, I have quite a history with this church, and uh, it's just wonderful coming in today. A, uh, one of the ushers, the usher on the far right, she said, oh, by the way, she said, I went to Highlanders with you. And, well, now, Highlanders was the, the high school group here in this church. I, I started uh, my ministry in this church. And in 1956, and my, my, my wife, Shirley, who's here with me today, actually came to this church in 54 because she was a student. And then, of course, uh, we got married a little later uh, after I got here and I proposed to her and all. And then uh, we had a daughter, Anne, and we were here. For, I was the youth pastor for, for eight years uh, until 1964 when we went to the Philippines. Then we had two more children. So then we uh, left from there, went to Berkeley, and I was, that's where I met Ken Sunu at, at Berkeley and his parents and being in that great church for 21 years. And then, would you believe it, back to university privilege. I just couldn't stay away. Uh, it, <laughs> and... Uh, that was, again, we arrived back here in 1991. This is a little more history than you ever imagined. And uh, all the way until 2008. Can you believe it? And it was just been a marvelous, uh, a marvelous run. Then a sort of, uh, I got together with a little committee of friends from this church, and they said, you know, uh, now you're going to, you, you probably want to retire a little bit, but why don't you do like John Stott did and just sort of become a pastor at large, uh, you know, and have a ministry that way. And so I did. And that, that is uh, the ministry that I've been in. And, you know, this church has considered the ministry of Earl Palmer ministry that I've had, like John Stott had a ministry after he had been at All Souls. And the uh, uh, you, you've uh, treated it as a mission partnership, and that's why we've had such a wonderful time being here during all these years since. And uh, I've had, had a wonderful time with the university ministry uh, s small study groups that I've been able to have with them, and it's just been a joy and just a great privilege uh, to be here today. We're right in the middle of Christmas tide, and that is also a joy, because we heard an amazing word uh, uh, was shared with the shepherds, and that is this great angel that appeared to them, and they were frightened, they were scared when they saw this angel, but the angel said, be not afraid, I bring you good news, and that's the word gospel, it appears right there in that in that amazing moment with the, with the shepherds, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then uh, joining with them was a chorus, a, a heavenly host, a chorus that sang to them the first Christmas carol, glory to God in the highest and on earth goodwill. By the way, that's the word, good, the good decision of God, goodwill toward all people. The word anthropos is used there, toward all people, and that's the good news. Well, that good news, uh, we're in the middle of it right now because we're in Christmas tide. Uh, actually, a week from now will be Epiphany when uh, it's often called uh, Wise Men Sunday, when the disclosure was clear of who Jesus Christ was in his baptism, and that is Epiphany. And this is now in Christmas tide when we focus on the gift of Jesus Christ himself. 
Hey, you know, uh, I chose as my text for today uh, a very favorite text of mine at the very beginning of Paul's letter to the Romans. And that is such a great, quote, a great text because the word gospel is used in that text. The same word used by the angel describing the coming of Christ. That's good news. And the opening of Paul's letter starts with these words. He says to the Romans, he's writing to the Romans, he's never been to Rome, but he's writing his greatest book to a place where he's never been yet. He will be there. He'll be imprisoned there at the end of his career, of his life. And by the way, that's where he'll write his book of Ephesians too, <laughs> that is the, one of his other large books. But the biggest book, his most important book, was Romans. And he started it this way. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteous character of God has broken through. By the way, the word apocalypse is used there. That means it's by surprise. It has broken through. Those shepherds were surprised. The wise men were surprised. Uh, Herod was surprised too. Uh, and uh, we saw that today. But uh, <laughs> this amazing uh, surprise... The righteous character of God has broken through his faithfulness for our faith. And then Paul decides to end that opening with a, a verse of scripture. And he chooses the book of Habakkuk and says, for the just shall live by the faithfulness of God. That is the way he begins Romans. I love that beginning. And, you know, here's an interesting thing. When I was a student at Princeton uh, in 1955, uh, because I became the, my first ministry was to be a senior, pa was to be youth pastor here at University Press when L. David Cowie was the pastor, and I was, the, I was a youth pastor with a high school that was Highlanders and the college group here. And when I came in 1956, before that, I was a student at Princeton Seminary. And in 1955, a very great man, a, a, Mary, a Maronite Catholic, professor of philosophy at the American University of Beirut, happened to be a, an ambassador from Lebanon to the United Nations. And during that tour of duty with the United Nations, he came to Princeton, and I had the privilege in 1955 of hearing him, and he spoke almost like St. Paul, who said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. He gave an amazing speech that became a very formative, influential moment of my life, and his name was Charles Malik, a Lebanese Marianite Catholic professor of philosophy. And he came to speak, and I had the chance to hear him. And here's what he said in that speech. Notice it almost sounds like Paul in Romans 1. Never be ashamed of Jesus Christ or of his gospel. This is now Charles Malick's speech. Never be ashamed of Jesus Christ or of his gospel. It is the only new thing in the world. All else is as old as the hills. Even the latest vaccine, and they had just invented the vaccine for polio, or the latest bomb, they were still experimenting with how to make nuclear weapons. Fortunately, later a treaty was signed by the nuclear countries to say that nuclear weapons should never ever be used. But he says in 1955, all else is as old as the hills, even the latest vaccine or the latest bomb. Only the eternal, only that which is the same yesterday, today, and forever is really new. 
And then he spoke to us as pastors, and I've never forgotten his final sentence to us. And here, imagine, just a year later, I started my career as a, as a pastor, and it became a very important part of my ministry to follow his final advice. Charles Malick said to us at Princeton that day in 1955, aim, therefore, always at that which is at once eternal, universal, personal, and concrete. It almost sounds like Romans 1. And it's, but it's interesting, it's, it's sort of odd that both in Romans 1 and here in uh, Charles Malick's great speech to us in 1955, the word ashamed appears. Ashamed is a, you know, it's a, it's a caustic word. It's an unfriendly word. No one likes the word ashamed. In fact, in many cultures of the world, the worst thing that can happen is if you're shamed by somebody, disrespected by someone. It means to, it means to be embarrassed. Actually, the, one of the other meanings of ashamed is fearful or uh, uh, dis despairing or angry and ashamed. And so Charles Malick said, never be ashamed of Jesus Christ or his gospel, the good news. And then St. Paul starts Romans with, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. But by raising the word ashamed in both the beginning of Romans and in this speech by Charles Malick, he does raise with us the question, why might you be ashamed? Why might you be ashamed of something that's called good news? Because a lot of times things are called good news and you need to test them to see if they are really good news, if they uh, are the truth, if, if you can count on them, because that's, that's the dark side of a shame. I'm not sure I can count on it. I am embarrassed by it, but here is this, you're calling it good news, and therefore there's a kind of alert in the word ashamed, the way Paul uses it and the way Charles Malick used it. Never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's what Paul said. Well, Take that seriously. It means that what ashamed has done to the text for us is to put us on alert to test everything we hear to see if it is true and deserves our loyalty and deserves our trust. And so that is the, you might say, that's the one good side of a shame. I'd like to give you kind of a, a humorous illustration that, that shows this. Uh, when I was, uh, when I was the, uh, here at University Press, uh, I, I, I did skits with one of the uh, fellow pastors with me, and, and those skits uh, we would do around w at our youth meetings and uh, in various places, and they were, we had committed to memory the great Bud Abbott and Lou Costello comedy routine, which was one of the greatest in all of vaudeville. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know. That's third base. That was a great comedy skit by B Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. And when in the 1980s, when our children, we now had three children when we came to Berkeley, and they were now high school kids. They were getting ready to go to college. And I felt they were a little bit deprived in not having more exposure to classic comedy. They, they, had, they had Saturday Night Live, and they had a lot of comedy exposure, but I wanted them to hear Bud Abbott and Lou Costello, and I found there was a tape, a tape of the broadcast in 1946, right at the, at the end of World War II, there was a broadcast that had 
the, the comedy hour, the Camel Cigarettes comedy hour for Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. And so I got that tape and I got my, my teenagers, my three teenagers and some of their friends, they were going to hear, hear me out and say, okay, let's see if this is really funny. And so we played it. And it's true, the Bud Abbott and Lou Costello did their famous sketch and people did think it was funny. But you know, what I didn't bargain for was that that tape that I got had all of the commercials that went with the show. And this was 1946. And when we got through the morning that we listened to it, the kids said, you know, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello were very funny, but the commercials were even funnier. And I'll, I'll give you one example to show you why. Because they, they had to, they had of course naturally to sell a product. The product was Camel cigarettes. Um, I don't know if that's a present uh, uh, problem for salespeople now to figure out how to urge people to buy that product. But they were trying to do it in that show and they, they did this. This is one part of that proof. There's an official, they had an official voice speaking uh, at one point and said, according to a recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. <laughs> the kids are kind of scratching their heads. In fact, one of them was hoping to go to medical school and wonder, is this what I have ahead of me? Uh, they'll be surveying me to, to find out what cigarette I smoke. But, and then comes the, the part of their, of their their proof now. Three leading independent research organizations asked this question of 113,597 doctors. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Now you probably enjoy rich, full flavor and cool mildness in a cigarette just as much as doctors do. And that's why if you're not a Camel smoker now, Try a camel and listen to this. On your T-zone, that's T for taste and T for throat. Your true proving ground, they're right at that point in the, in the show, your true proving ground for any cigarette. See if camel's rich flavor of superbly blended choice tobaccos isn't extra delightful to your taste. And see if camel's cool mildness isn't in harmony with your throat. See if you too don't say, camels suit my T-zone to a T. <laughs> this is a very friendly, uh, friendly ad, but it's all untrue. It is untrue. It's not true. So you'd be ashamed of it if you said, now that's the good news. The good news, uh, from NBC this week is this. Uh, and there's been a survey done even to see if it isn't proved. Uh, doctors were asked, what cigarette do you smoke? Uh, but you know, cigarettes uh, are not uh, good for your T-zone. Your throat, uh, that, that is a smoker's hack problem. Uh, it, or your, your lungs, that's even worse. But there is no truth in the ad. But the ad, therefore, is you're embarrassed. You're embarrassed by that ad. You're embarrassed by that. If you were to believe that as a good news, you would not trust it. So anyway, the, you think about it for a minute. When Charles Malik and Carl and, and, and Paul wrote Romans and Charles Malik's wonderful speech that he gave to us, they raised the question, don't be ashamed of the gospel. So that means they're inviting us to test whether the gospel is true. And sometimes it sounds, a, a good news sounds impressive, uh, but, it, but it, 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 it's false. And if it's false, it's not true, then you'd be ashamed of it. You should not trust it. Or secondly, what if it sounds uh, and is not necessarily wrong or false, 
but it's not significant enough. Uh, it, is, it, it is not something you can count on because it's, you call it good news, but it really isn't, it in, over the long haul, it's not significant enough. Or what if this gospel is not accessible except to a special secret circle? Now we're getting to in more dangerous territory. The gospel is called good news, but it's not accessible except for a special select circle who uh, claim a kind of maybe mysterious source of their good news. So when I join that circle, then uh, I see those outside of the circle as my enemies, and I see those inside the circle as my friends, because I have now a special kind of good news that is favoring my circle. In 1944, C.S. Lewis gave a very famous speech that he, that he called uh, the inner ring in which he talked about circles that you can join, that when you join that m mysterious circle, uh, it gives you a kind of special strength or a special belonging. And, uh, and so he gave that speech. And then a little later, he wrote one of his last great novels about that sort of problem uh, that's called that hideous strength where a young, uh, young scholar joins a circle within a, within a college, and uh, that circle became, becomes his life, and everything depends on him being in that circle where he gets that approval. And that was the hideous strength that Lewis wrote, his last major adult novel. He had started with... Uh, out of the Silent Planet, then Paralander, and then in 1945, right at the end of World War II, he wrote that hideous strength. But before that, in 1944, he gave a speech that got him ready for that called, uh, the speech was called The Inner Ring. And in that, he makes this amazing, he makes this amazing comment of showing the danger of that kind of, of that kind of, good news. He says, of all passions, the passion for the inner ring, to belong to the inner ring, is the most skillful in making a man who is not yet a very bad man to do bad things. And we think of how many people have been uh, caught up in, in a ring that they join. Uh, or a, an advocacy that they join and feel it, it, they, they get power from it, but it becomes a very dangerous kind of belonging. So we should be ashamed of that. It's called good news because we have a good program. It's going to give more power to our political party or more power to our religion or whatever we are trying to get power for. And it, it's, it's an inner ring. And Lewis makes that very amazing comment. He says, of all the passions, the passion for the inner ring, to be in that inner ring where there is power, is the most skillful in making a man or woman who is not yet a very bad person do very bad things. And that brings us to the fourth and the worst kind of uh, danger when we... we we have a false good news, and that is the danger of toxic, uh, toxic results, results that are toxic. It was Pascal who said, men never delight in doing evil as much as if they can do it for religious reasons. And so we see how often religion can become toxic. Uh, Movements can become toxic because they, uh, they have power with that, but it is, it is a, dangerous, uh, a dangerous kind of uh, power. 
very dangerous. And uh, we need a solution for it. Because the good news is about Jesus Christ and his love for us. And that's why Charles Malick said, never be ashamed of Jesus Christ or his good news. The cure is a greater is a greater truth, a greater good news that we can then, uh, we can belong to and trust. And it, gi it gives us uh, an answer to uh, the foolishness of, the, of, a, of an ad that says, uh, what, what cigarette do you smoke? But cigarettes are not good for your T-zone, they're bad. It gives you the clarity to be able to analyze something on the basis of truth. And also, uh, it, it can be the cure for where we stumble or become a part of an inner ring that is doing actual harm. And so, uh, the gospel that we're told to trust why should we trust the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, St. Paul calls it in Ephesians, the belt that holds everything together. He calls the, and when he talks about the whole armor of God, he says that he starts with the belt of truth. Truth holds us together. And so the gospel is true. And that truth is holding us together. Uh, the gospel is also universal. The gospel invites us, invites all people to discover the good news of Jesus Christ. It's in, in that sense, it's, it's not tribal. It's not dependent on a circle. The problem with the circles is that you begin to you begin to look at those outside your circle as your enemy. But the gospel is universal. And Jesus Christ is the one who heals that uh, the badness of, of a circle that goes bad. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the very interesting uh, one of the very interesting places where Jesus takes on error, takes on things that are happening that are wrong in our lives, where they become toxic, is in the fifth chapter, at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord says, you have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor, that's good, right, and hate your enemy. But that's nowhere in the Old Testament. It's, it is in the Dead Sea Scrolls that you should hate foreigners and hate people that, that are not in your tribe or not in your circle. But <clears throat> our Lord then takes that on and says, you've heard it said <clears throat> that you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. And that will show that you are a child of your father in heaven that will show that you're in that you're in his uh, universal family so it'll give you a true and a universal uh, uh, belonging non-tribal but universal and the gospel is strong Jesus Christ is able to uh, heal that badness or to heal that time when, we, when things go awry, uh, even bad religious instincts that Pascal was worried about. He's able to heal those for us. In, in, in the book of Romans, in this very book of Romans, Paul will, will put it this way, when he gets to the 12th chapter of Romans, he will say, uh, he says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, 
Leave room for the wrath of God. Let God be the judge because vengeance belongs to him. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Some people think the burning coals meant judgment. No, it means help. Because in a Bedouin society, if you need a campfire and you don't have a fire, uh, you can borrow coals from your neighbor. And that's what the book of Proverbs means when it says that's the coals of fire that you can give to someone so they can start their fire. It will give coals. So do not be, and then St. Paul ends that line with this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There is a goodness that is stronger than evil. You know, today we read of the death of Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, the great. Uh, he was the Holy Father, uh, the, the, the Pontiff who retired, and to, and today he died. Uh, I was really, I was really taken by Benedict the Sixteenth, especially when his very first encyclical. You know, when a pope writes an encyclical. It's known by the, the first three letters or the first three words in the encyclical. And his very first encyclical, Benedict XVI, was Charitas est Deus. God is love. And in that wonderful uh, encyclical, Benedict said, love is not a theory. Love is not an idea. It's an event that happened. And that event is Jesus Christ himself. The same yesterday, today, and forever. But Jesus Christ is that love. It's what he does in our behalf. And I, I loved that, that encyclical. And he, in the very opening lines of the encyclical, he says, is love an idea? Or is it an event that happened? It's an event that happened when Jesus Christ identified with us and forgave our sins and healed us. And so you need a gospel that is universal. We need a gospel that's true. We need a gospel that is strong and able to do that. And finally, best of all, we need the gospel that is good. It is good. Uh, it has a, that is the deep meaning of the word salvation that Paul uses in, Roman, in Romans 16, 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. Salvation, that means safety, for the safety that comes in knowing that Jesus Christ is alive, that his love is there, that he's able to heal us and make us whole. And that safety, that salvation, that's eternal and it's new. Charles Malick said it's the newest thing in the world. And I love a line from G.K. Chesterton who is saying in, in one of his uh, books, he said, we have sinned and grown old. Our father is younger than we are. His, he has the appetite for newness and that newness is the newness of the gospel and he makes things new and he's able to heal and forgive and make it new so uh, they said they were not ashamed and by erasing that word they asked us to think through what is the good news are we following a good news that is toxic or dangerous, or are we following a good news that is healing and whole and good? And uh, Benedict XVI said it right when he said, God is love. He is the author of love. And that love is an event that happened in Jesus Christ himself. That's what we celebrate on, at Christmas. That's what's disclosed. Uh, 
in Epiphany. And that's what's made for us in Pentecost. Ours, we get to have it too. For everyone, we can have it. We can have this universal, true, strong, and good beginning to a new year. Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, amazing text and that it's ours and we can claim it and we can enjoy it and we can realize that it's eternal, it's personal, and it's good. It's wonderfully good. It doesn't exclude others. It invites us all to discover that love. And Lord, we thank you that Jesus is our teacher. And he's the one who is able to heal the brokenness that sometimes seals us up in, in circles we should not be sealed up in and then gives us the freedom to share that good news with those around us. We thank you for that. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen.